Hello, I'm Kay Sidebottom and um, I'm a lecturer in education based at the University of Leeds, which is in the north of England in Yorkshire. And it's really lovely to be here with you tonight and talking to you all the way over in Zurich. So for the past um, four or five years, I've been exploring post-human critical theory as a way of making sense of the complex times that we're living in. And this has been primarily inspired by the work of Rosie Bredotti, but also Deleuze and Guattari, Donna Haraway, and many other writers. But also, and this is quite surprising for me, it's also been a process of thinking through the use of art. And I say surprising because I don't consider myself an artist in any sense. I don't create anything that's particularly visually appealing, although I do put some nice slides together. Um, but what I've been finding is that using art as a way to reimagine the world is helping me certainly deal and build resilience for working within a very difficult education centre in England. So I've been rethinking my role as a teacher educator to take on that idea of using art as a vehicle and how we can use that, as I say, to reimagine the world. The phrase uh, that I've used here as a title, Art as a Thing That Does, is a phrase spoken by uh, Maria Harvelova, who's an artistic director based in Utrecht in the Netherlands. And Maria's belief is that during times of interregnum, so moments like the ones we're living through at the moment, in which the old is dying and the new cannot be born, which are the words of Gramsci, art can provide an important means by which to explore possibilities. And really, this is because language hasn't caught up yet to express the complexity of, of our predicament. So this idea of using art as a way to express ourselves both as teachers and students is something that I'm going to talk a little bit about tonight and I'm going to do the presentation in two halves. In the first I'm going to speak about a project that I was involved in within further education in England and further education if you don't know is um, based around colleges which are for students aged from 16 to 19 years old and the second project that I'm going to talk about is focusing on a, a recent period of strike action, industrial action, which was the UCU union uh, within higher education universities in England and the UCU went on strike um, over the winter of last year and again this is somewhere where I didn't expect art to emerge but actually proved to be very transformational. So I hope you enjoy it and if you want to pose any questions then please put them on Facebook and um, I can respond to you. So a little bit of context then to start. So in England education, very much like everything else in England at the moment, is in crisis and for a number of years the pressures of increased managerialism, underfunding, um, dependence on sort of increasingly instrumental teaching methodologies, uh, pedagogical models that are really transactional um, and very much focused around tests have combined to create a very toxic, um, a very hostile environment and the morale of staff is exceptionally low. Mental health issues here are also on the rise both for students and for teachers. Universities, um, once places, you know, more of relative academic freedom, are suffering the same neoliberal fate as other parts of the education sector here. And this is coming with the introduction of very stringent metrics, frameworks, which measure anything that can be measured, and very precarious employment practices are threatening to constrain creativity and deplete any forms of um, liberatory practice. A few words as again about my ontology I guess and my thinking and one of the ways in which I've tried to um, reframe what it means to be human in the world today is to use this idea of moving beyond the human and the phrase here by Rosie Bradotti, none of us can say with any degree of certainty that we've always been human or that we're only that. Is, is really the starting point for me. And it's thinking about how, for us in education, we can move beyond 
the idea of the perfectly idealized Vitruvian man. So the white male who is physically fit, um, able-bodied, European, probably straight, although we, we know that da Vinci was actually probably gay, and everything around that kind of default heteronormative setting that, that we find ourselves in. And this was this is a challenge for me, working within a teacher education curriculum, which is very much centred around white male thinkers, uh, European and from the States. So this idea of saying, actually, we need to change this paradigm because I don't know many people who are like that. Um, and it certainly doesn't feel relevant for our times today. So that was one of the kind of backdrops to the, the way in which I've been kind of rethinking um, the curriculum, not just rethinking it in terms of things like reading lists, making things better balanced or more diverse, but also in terms of thinking, actually, can we go back to art and can we use that to help us move um, beyond these, these old outdated ideas of humanity? So images like this one by um, Harmonia Rosales, underrepresented, uh, I think is a fascinating and really insightful way to say, hold on a minute, let's try and um, reimagine things. Let's stop and examine the images that provide the backdrop to the way that we educate and think differently. And Harmonia, this is her quote, art forms the basis for resistance. And I love that we can use art, even though we might not think of ourselves as artists, as a vehicle uh, for resisting in many different ways. The third image I've chosen here, again, is that challenge to humanism. And as I say, not only are our texts as teacher educators very much rooted in um, the thinking of the, the white male canon, they are also rooted in humanistic approaches. So from sociologists such as Abraham Maslow um, to Carl Rogers, very much this idea of centering hum humans and placing them at the top of the pyramid, if you like. <clears throat> So this idea of having a very restricted notion of what counts as human um, has been something else that we thought, actually, how can we utilise images such as this to really challenge ourselves? Because for us ourselves as teachers, we will find ourselves in classroom spaces with people who certainly don't fit uh, the Vitruvian mould. Lastly, in terms of the, the context, the backdrop to all of this, is this idea of the need to act and the notion that we live in anthropocentric times and a time of certainly environmental degradation. We see this all around us. We see the threat of uh, climate change, certainly mass migration and the fear of that, um, certainly behind Brexit, um, along with the racist undertones that goes with it in, in England today and the subsequent rise of the far right, which I think possibly been a little understated in our country, but certainly is a, a massive cause for concern and the acceleration of capitalism. And alongside that, what goes on in our sector, sector is very much around funding cuts, the rise of mental health issues, increased managerialism, the very much market-driven bureaucratization of the system, leading to a, a sense of academic capitalism. So this image here, bluebells in a wood not far from me in York, is uh, the, this idea really of education being rhizomatic. And technically the bluebell isn't a rhizomatic plant, I've learned, uh, but it does have that idea of the springing up of the unexpected. So in this example, bluebells are a plant that you don't always know are there. They will suddenly emerge possibly at times when you most need to see them, so at times where hope is, is required. And the idea of the rhizome in being the root that kind of snakes beneath the ground, maybe a little bit subversive, maybe popping up in places where people might not want it to. Weeds are, are very often rhizomes. And we came to think of ourselves within our curriculum, within our practice as uh, something a bit like a rhizomatic plant. So we've extended our, our curriculum, our community of practice outside of the classroom, outside of the organisations uh, within which we work. And something that I'm very keen to push forward is this idea of working nomadically and working 
cross institutionally, cross country even, certainly across the world, to build communities that act outside those formal hierarchies that can constrain us. So very much like the Bluebell, um, joining together to forge a way forward. My question here, how can we come to terms with the breathtaking transformations of our times while being able to endure and re resist? Um, from Bray Dottian and Harvey Over, is very much thinking about how on earth can we, as teachers, as students, working together within these rhizomatic communities, how can we face um, what we're facing and get past that and be able to keep going, to resist, um, when we're up against a, a huge amount in terms of pressures, of stress, of daily challenges to our own values. And what, what does that mean to us? How can we, we enact that? That question was a really important one and it's what led me on to the first project um, that I will be, be talking about. I'm going to read in a moment from this book which is about decentering educators, decentering researchers in order to challenge that paradigm where the teacher themselves is, is at the top of the tree. And I wrote this chapter earlier this year when I was thinking about how we would use art in order to level the playing field and also to bring in and I guess augment the voices of, of certainly the students that, that we're working with. So the project that I'm going to talk about today is this one that was created alongside my students. This is within our college in Barnsley. Barnsley is a very deprived town in the north of England. It's an ex-mining community. And the reason I, I stress that point is that art was something that for many of my students was not a thing that they did. And it certainly wasn't something that they would spend their time thinking about either creating or going to see. And I, I don't say that to, to be patronising. Certainly in England, there was a culture um, in the days when people would be able to spend time out of work they might have benefits they might have time and space um, and actually freedom to create <clears throat> this time certainly within the current paradigm of um, workfulness has something that's been squeezed out so there is no time for idleness um, certainly within our country at the moment if you're unemployed then you will be seeking work actively and, and that will be measured so the idea of going to an art gallery um, for pleasure or for work was something that was quite certainly unusual um, for my students but in Barnsley we're lucky enough to have a, a gallery the Cooper gallery you can see the image here right opposite the college and my first thought was how can we work with this gallery to integrate it somehow into our teacher training curriculum. So my students are all training to be teachers. They're mainly working in the lifelong learning sector. So that means that they will be teaching adults, primarily in colleges, but maybe in community centers or prisons or hospitals or within um, the voluntary sector and so on. So these students, as, as part of their curriculum, one of the requirements was that they had to create a reflective journal. And the idea of the reflective journal is that they sit down and they write a diary and they think about their teaching practice and they comment on what's gone well and what could have gone better. And the reflective journal, it, it forms a large part of their assessment. Um, the reflective process is done individually and it tends to always be in a written format of some kind. As I say, most commonly something like a physical diary. And for a while that, that troubled me slightly because I know that when we reflect on things, we don't always do that alone. Very often we might be speaking to friends or family, or we might be sat in the car and thinking and, and talking to ourselves on the way home. But we're not alone, actually, in doing that. We're talking in some kind of a space. We're interacting with the things around us. And what I found, certainly what my students found, was that they're adults. A lot of them have families. They have pets. <clears throat> and for them, the process of reflecting would be often going out walking with their dog or sat 
stroking their cat or something like that. So I was really interested in how we could rethink what it meant to uh, reflect. And one of the things that we did to try and break through this and think about it differently was we went to the Cooper Art Gallery and what I asked them to do was to choose, first of all, um, a painting or a sculpture or something within the gallery that they felt connected with their journey as a teacher, as a trainee teacher. So they went around the gallery. You can see uh, David and Adam in the picture here having a look at some, um, some paintings. They went around and they chose something that they felt in some way not necessarily symbolised but connected with them and their teaching experience. And I expected that to be quite a, not a negative exercise necessarily, but it's a time of struggle when you learn to be a teacher. And I expected them to choose images that were, that represented their challenges in some way, but that actually didn't happen. What they did was they made connections on quite a deep level. So they chose images that, you know, you certainly wouldn't have assumed that they would have chosen. Uh, what when, then came on from that was that they started to create some of their own artworks. Now some of them do have art experience but some of them teach all kinds of different subjects and have never done any art really in their lives, maybe some at school. And so what we did then was we thought about what kind of art they might like to create. So for some of them, as in the example here, they chose to create collages or um, they use fabrics, textiles, that kind of thing. For others, they might choose another form. So some wrote poetry, some use photography, and all kinds of different media in the end in order to kind of express what they, what they were feeling. One student used, um, actually took it into a more sort of bodily effective form, and she was having a particularly tough time at that, at that period. And she ended up doing some painting, but she was using it her own tears around that. So it was a, a real embodied experience for her. So I'm going to go on and just read um, a little bit from the book. This is actually a conversation between myself, Kay, and David Ball. David is the gentleman at the front of the photo here, who was one of the trainee teachers who took part in this um, experiment. So, Kay. This is me. Let's go back to the beginning. David, can you remember when we started talking about using art as a thing that does in our teacher training sessions? David, yes, I do. It was in relation to reflective practice. Creating art has always had an element of reflection for me, be it a self-portrait or something more abstract. So reflection had always felt a quite natural way in which to develop artistic ideas. I remember visiting art exhibitions throughout my teacher training first as subject-specific personal development for myself, but also as a way to start thinking more deeply about issues I may have had in my teaching. I had two very different experiences, one as a teacher leading taster sessions in art and craft situations, and the second was teaching a more traditional qualification within a local art college. When I spent time looking at art, I found that pieces might jump out at me, perhaps helping me to examine a relationship that was forming during my teaching placement or to suggest a solution for an issue with a student's work. Then I remember you leading a session where we visited a local exhibition space and we all chose artworks to describe an element of teaching that we were struggling with, an aspect of our teacher identity or another um, issue that we felt we needed to unpack further. I chose an image of a storm, a painting whose elements felt allegorical for my feelings at that particular time. I then went on to transcribe this image as a sketch, which gave me further information to reflect upon. The transcription process highlighted to me the key elements of my feelings about why I'd chosen the image, mark making suggested conflict, and the line and movement described the state of flux that I found myself in. The other trainee teachers responded really well to this too. This was quite surprising for some individuals in the group for whom an art gallery visit wasn't an everyday experience. Offering up images, objects and paintings as a springboard for reflection seemed natural and the responses back from the group were deeply personal and pertinent. So we moved on from this idea about thinking, how can we connect this to some of the theory, some of the critical post-human theory and that idea of 
art as a transformative uh, way of reimagining the world. And I took as a stimulus for this the Deleuzean idea of the cosmic artisan. And when I first came across that term, it felt like quite a presumptuous, maybe slightly affected um, way for us to describe ourselves. But I'm going to talk a little bit more now from the book about how we, we came to that idea. So, okay, me. I'm going to talk about another Deleuzean idea now, that of the cosmic artisan. An artisan for Deleuze and Guattari is someone who is determined to follow the flow of matter, where the matter or the material itself interacts, that's a Karen Barad term, with the creator too, very much in the way that our reflections were entwined with and informed by our creations. By harnessing and connecting with a range of forces, the energy of the potential that we talked about earlier, the artisan suddenly becomes cosmic. Part of me resists the notion of putting this label on ourselves, the fear of seeming pretentious, but also because it in some way suggests that I'm empowered to do this on your behalf. Not all of us may buy into it. <clears throat> However, I do feel a lot of re resonance with the cosmic artisan idea. As Schultz describes them, cosmic, cosmic artisans exist at the limit, are fabulators in the sense that they actualize lines of flight, potentials that exist imminently, virtually and intensively. And I love that idea of us being potentials. It feels very countercultural in a system that's risk averse, avoids complexity and privileges the idea of replicable positivist outcomes to reflective practice. So the usual thing within the diary where we would say things like, if I do X next time, then Y should happen. David, in this analogy then, are the lines of flight, Deleuze and Guattari, the movements away from the status quo that cosmic artisans enact? I certainly see them as actions that disrupt and destabilise accepted teaching norms. It's normal to reflect in a diary format, and this feels very different. Perhaps our strongest line of flight, if that is a thing, was to then hold an exhibition off-site at a completely different college. It was almost breaking apart the notion of the work being part of a formal assessed assignment. By taking our work outside of its normal location and displaying it in a different place for a different purpose, we were playing with the temporality of assessment and resisting the way that our teaching journeys were stratified and territorialized, as Deleuze and Guattari might say. So what we did, as I mentioned there, was we decided to take our creations and the students were not just using them as means by which to be assessed as being a good reflective practitioner, but actually what would happen if we took those into a public space. And in the third image here, we created um, an art exhibition, which we called Becoming Teacher. And it was a multidisciplinary collection of the artworks that we created, that, as I say, ranged from paintings to photography. Um, we also kind of played around with the idea of teachers. So we wrote out our poems on blackboards and um, the fact that we were kind of using a classroom in this way, um, you know, felt quite transgressive. So the exhibition opened and what we wanted to do was kind of provoke some thinking around how it actually felt to be a trainee teacher um, in the middle of a, a very deprived city in very difficult times and this idea of becoming teacher the idea that there was never going to be an end point that people got to but it was always an emerging and experience of kind of growth and progression and also not an individual story either these were collaborative pieces and this idea of the the reflective journal as an individualistic um, reflection on a journey wasn't representative of the actual real life experience. So this idea of using art in this way um, was challenging in trying for me to fit it within quite a, a formal university assessment structure. So when I came to mark this work, that was quite a challenge. Um, and certainly it was a challenge to convince the university awarding body and the quality assurance processes and all of those things that what had actually happened here was something that could be measured and graded and um, it, it took quite a bit of thinking about 
but actually it was one of those situations where you could say regardless of what has been created what has the impact been and how have the teachers changed what have they learned um, are they more likely to sustain their roles are they less likely to leave is there something here that they can bring forward into their own teaching practice that they can utilize with their own students etc so i think when we were looking at outcomes which is a word often bandied about within education at the moment there was lots that, that we could say about it and as a result this idea of using art um, as a way to to reflect on teaching practice has been absorbed into the wider um, university curriculum. So that was the, the first part of my story, Art as a Thing That Does. Um, I'm going to break off now and then if anyone wants to ask any questions, I can respond to those. Then in the second part, I will talk a little bit more about the picket line as um, a site of artistic pedagogy. So this is the second part of my presentation. And in this half, I'm going to be talking a bit about um, the strike action that took place earlier this year and its connection to artistic pedagogy and as an educator with I would say anarchist um, tendencies I was really interested in how education could continue during um, a time of industrial action so what happened um, in reality was that the way education is mediated now, so, so through social media, through academics engaging with students online in, in all kinds of different formal and informal spaces, is that there is no clear boundary um, these days between learning and not learning. So the fact that um, academics weren't teaching and were on strike didn't necessarily mean that the learning stopped and that really interested me as a principle of withdrawal of labour. So what does labour mean in a time of te technological mediation and how does that affect strike action? So I was reflecting on this both as a participant of the strike but also as someone who is very interested in, in how these spaces work and how different assemblages form to create striking bodies, if you like. So in this presentation, I'm gonna share some images that I took and I was very keen to capture moments of the strike uh, through photography. So I took images and um, pictures as the strike went on, but what I wanted to do was to not include humans in the pictures, because so I was interested in the impact of the sort of material assemblages that formed, whether those be through um, symbolic items like the placards, the banners, um, the tents that, that were used, maybe through animals and how they kind of interacted with the spaces and um, how creativity as well was used as um, a, a different medium when people were coming together in, in kind of different formations. There's something interesting about space I think now for academics as well because very often people don't come to buildings to work, they might be based at home, they might be working on a laptop in a coffee shop and what does that mean again for picketing? How do you have a picket line when your office is your home? And again I try to capture images of, of what that was all about, what it meant to have a virtual picket line. So a bit of background about the strike action then. So it was the University College Union, the UCU, went on strike um, between February and March earlier this year. And it was over a threat to essentially downgrade the pension fund. And this affected thousands of academic staff um, in universities. Around 64 universities in the UK were affected. And so the strike action ran over 14 days between February and March during I think one of the harshest winters that we've seen here in England for a very long time. So it was the longest ever strike in UK history in higher education. Um, around 42,000 staff went on strike and approximately 575,000 teaching hours were lost. That's an estimate of how many hours were lost. And it wasn't just the lecturers that were involved, there were other members of staff as well, but also students um, took part. There were many occupations of university buildings by students 
and this was obviously um, a symbol of solidarity with um, their striking professors. As I mentioned, social media was used as a big organising tool, as is the case these days in times of activism, and it was used both for organising and also for the creation of different memes and different creative ways to engage and um, show solidarity in the strike. There's one particular hashtag, um, hashtag no capitulation, which proved fairly momentous when the UCU were trying to reach an agreement with the employers and the, um, the strikers, the activists felt that it wasn't um, a fair and just um, agreement. So it was overturned due mainly to the strength of feeling that, was, um, that arose behind that hashtag. So I think that, that idea of using social media in a way that was subverting and organising but outside of the institutional framework was, was really interesting, particularly when you think that many universities had encouraged in all sorts of maybe different coercive ways academics to be using those tools as promotion for them. So it turned that tool back, back in on itself uh, again, which was a really interesting thing. So I'll share um, some of the images now that I took during the strike. First one here was just to show we're not used to snow really like this in England and it was quite ironic I think that we had the worst snow for many years during this period of time and I was interested in what impact the weather had on the strike action. Um, obviously strikes don't happen in, in a neutral space there's all kinds of things that impact on how they manifest and how they are carried out and the snow in in terms of this strike had all kinds of interesting effects one of which was the increase in the sense of solidarity of um, battle and of trying to overcome and also I think in terms of the garnering of public sympathy and particularly student sympathy it, it resulted in different formations of people across campuses coming together in different spaces, maybe spaces that they hadn't even visited before, um, and what that meant in terms of people sharing and fostering spirit of community against not only um, the sort of withdrawal of their employment, but also against the kind of weather and the other elements that seem to be, um, you know, really fighting against them. So creativity was, was a very strong point of the strike and just as some examples here one of the interesting things that emerged was the emblem of a dinosaur as um, a sort of symbol of both kind of uh, dis disaffectation but also solidarity and the University of Southampton um, their UCU official had an inflatable dinosaur suit which uh, she wore and danced in which was hugely funny but was also became a bit of a meme it was a, a real sim symbol uh, of the strike and the, the hat at the bottom right here was knitted and, and had the dinosaur on it and so on there were lots of ways of kind of co-created co-constructed um, pieces of art that were, that were made during this time one of which was the patchwork blanket I think that was the University of Exeter where people knitted and contributed squares and it was kind of um, a physical manifestation of that sense of community people contributing and building um, something out of this period of activism embroidery again um, people using the time that kind of dead time when you're standing around for, for many hours to create things and knitting as well was something that really came out so it was interesting how people were using that time not only to kind of talk to each other to meet people from different areas of the university but also to kind of create things and I think for many academics that time has been so much squeezed out due to um, precarity due to the way that um, teaching is organised, that for people to have those kind of periods of pause where they could go back and, and um, craft or write or create in some kind of way, again, sort of was a symptom, I think, again, of the, the lack of time and how time in these sort of spaces of kind of in between were, were being utilised. So that was, that was a really interesting thing that emerged. 
Another thing was the critters, and I've used the word critters, drawing on Haraway's notion here. These were our kind of animals that we were thinking with or that we were um, striking with in a way. So from the flamingo on the right hand side here to the real animals, dogs, very English, I think, to dress your dogs up and bring those onto the picket line. So those animals kind of forming um, part of the spaces. And I think for those people who were based at home, who were maybe creating their own picket lines, quite interested in how their pets kind of then formed part of that virtual space. So for those workers who um, were using their office, they were actually very often kind of building their own picket or building their own barrier. And that might have been through having their own placards outside their office door. So an office like this one that they weren't allowing either themselves or their partners to, to cross, to cross that picket line. So the idea of a virtual picket in a, a time where people aren't physically based in, um, in sort of communal buildings, again, was something that emerged, but in a really sort of creative, very clever way. This last one is um, coming back to the idea of the placard, which again, very classic symbol of union activity and again formed a very big part of the action and this particular picture here shows an office that was converted into a placard hospital the idea being that a number of the placards were destroyed by particularly the snow the ice um, got very very damp when it rained and got very wet so they would come into the placard hospital and then be put back together ready for the next day of strike action. And again, the, the idea of the placards being very much part of that assemblage, it wouldn't have been the strike without those objects. So the role of things, of materials, um, to form part of a striking assemblage was really interesting to me. And the kind of um, reliance on those kind of sim symptomatic pieces of board essentially how they kind of manifest in some kind of um, physical representation of, of a strike and also the care that was actually given to those placards people really looked after them cared for them and put them back together um, when they got broken so I'm going to finish here and just draw a few threads together um, really around the way that I've used post-human um, critical thinking critical theory to really challenge my own ideas of research practice and what I've started to build here are a few ideas of what I feel that post-human research practice might look like. So firstly this idea of problematizing the accepted status quo so looking at something that appears quite normal um, quite every day but making a problem out of it, becoming conscious of it and then turning it into an issue. And I think that was certainly seen in our problematization of reflective practice in the first project where we took something that was just accepted as standard practice for trainee teachers and said, hang on a minute, is this really working? Is there another way that we can view this in order to improve um, the process for ourselves? The second part goes right back to the start, this idea of rethinking and questioning what actually means to be human. And if we refuse to accept the Vitruvian man symbol of humanity as meaning what is human for us, um, what does that impact on in terms of how we research and, and how we educate? And that might be all sorts of things around challenging the, the hierarchy of, of humans in thinking, bringing animals in, critters, thinking about the influence of material objects and so on. It might be thinking about non-human others, people who throughout history have not been included in that identity as the, the kind of perfect human. I've used the word centering and decentering the researcher here and by centering I'm thinking about cons the consideration of your own positionality and for me as a researcher within um, education it's thinking about my role and my entanglement with my own students um, and how much I can really split myself away from those projects when I'm very much bound up and influencing the direction of them. So centering, thinking about positions, but then decentering. So starting to remove the human, or not completely, obviously, but thinking about what else is interacting, what else is affecting the research process. 
I've mentioned the sensitivity to academic rhythms and the idea of time and space here. And again, this was interesting in terms of the strike action, which operated within a very strict time frame in order to have an impact on um, an exam period. So it had to operate within the academic rhythms and within the academic year. And we can be, as researchers, I think, very much constrained by those rhythms. We're um, working towards deadlines which are imposed through the publication of journals or the um, construction of metrics to do with research output and that kind of thing. So we're very much caught up within that kind of time and space. And how that affects us in terms of creativity, in terms of output, in terms of thinking, um, and certainly thinking time. And going back to the strike action and the idea of the creativity that emerged in those dead times, in that space of nothingness where we weren't able to work, I think is something important when we think about how constrained we are now in terms of um, productivity and the need to continually um, be productive. The God trick is Donna Haraway's idea of the researcher as the all-seeing, all-knowing eye that looks down on the research subjects and operates from an entirely neutral position. And the idea that we cannot see ourselves in that role because we are enmeshed, we're entangled, we are influencing through the role that we undertake. And that could be negatively um, through the way in which we are um, positioning our own research subjects or it could be just unknowingly really because we, we don't understand what influence we have in terms of bias so it's saying you know research cannot be a search for absolute truths um, instead we have to recognize our own position within that and um, see the bigger picture if you like paying attention to the material so the impact of things objects uh, materials how they affect the assemblages that are recreated either in our educational space in the story of the strike action what the influence of those objects are and thinking about what they symbolize where they come from um, how they're affecting what happens how things play out and very much related to that this idea of us as embodied subjects so not splitting out the fact that we um, are physical that our bodies affect and are affected with, within research practices, that we cannot um, keep thinking of the mind as a separate unit that we can fill um, with transmitted information. Considering R as being a thing that does so, as I've said all the way through this, where words don't suffice or words haven't come to emerge and, and find meaning for the new ideas where we can bring art in and think about that as a way of explaining or helping us to connect in different ways not just with our own thoughts but with the wider world with each other um, in the fostering the building of community and lastly that idea of um, post-human research is maintaining that reflexive element so the continue questioning of our own assumptions our own beliefs our own positionality and bringing in the humility that that is needed in order to properly do the work i'm going to leave you with a quote this is from carol taylor and her ideas about post-human research so it is an enactment of knowing and being that emerges in the event of doing research itself in opening new means to integrate thinking and doing offers an invitation to come as you are and to experiment invent and create and i hope what i've shown you tonight is a way of looking creatively and maybe through a different lens on maybe standard practices or things that events that emerge in some way and thinking about how art can just help us reimagine uh, those things in order to create a better future so thank you very much for listening I've got a few references here if you want to follow up any of the texts that I've been talking about tonight. I'm very happy if anyone wants to email me to share those with you or if you want to ask me any questions then certainly feel free to do that through Cameron's Facebook page and um, I look forward to discussing and speaking to people more about it. Thank you and good night.